crown him with many crowns. Uh, the man on the right 
Yes, Mike, you're right, the man, the, the husband, the groom, this is the only one. He's, a, he's an intern, a, a pastoral intern or assistant under Wayne uh, in the church, I think in Simignani, and uh, he has waited a long time for a bride, and so he's finally married, and this was their first wedding at the church, and so it was just a, a great, great celebration, praise the Lord, for a godly wife. And uh, just a reminder... A godly spouse is worth waiting for. Amen. Young people look carefully and long uh, before rushing into marriage. Uh, and then, of course, the Simonyeni Center for the Disabled is another ministry that they uh, are involved in and started. Uh, they had uh, 21, I believe, 21 young people from the ages of 7 to 27 uh, disabled, handicapped uh, children that they work with. And uh, this, this young man, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, but I just wanted to read a little bit about him. Uh, he was one of their first students when they first started. Remember, I think they started with three. Uh, he's 22 years old. He's physically and mentally challenged. And yet he has trusted Christ. He's been baptized. And he attends the Simonyeni Bible Church. Two years ago, uh, he was admitted to a government hospital. Uh, he had some other uh, internal problems that he was admitted for. Uh, but his mother, who was an alcoholic, beat him while he was there. Um, he almost died. Uh, there was no social worker at the hospital. Um, anyways, he stayed there for a number of weeks with a catheter in. Finally, he was discharged. They found he had a stricture had developed, and they said that surgery was needed to remove that stricture. This was two years ago. Since that time, he's uh, been in pain with a suprapubic catheter or something, and surgery's been canceled four times because they don't consider him very urgent. Uh, even the private doctor indicated that uh, such and such, his name, was as good as he would ever get or it would not be worth the cost. Uh, meanwhile, we have found some med medicine that does help with the pain and had a nurse attending to him every few weeks. <coughs> to the calling uh, to the hospital to check on his surgery date of December 3rd, once we were again told, no, he's, he, he's not, that's not needed. There seemed to be no hope. Then very unexpectedly, a large financial gift came in from one of our supporters. We also referred, we were also referred to a caring doctor who gave us hope, and he is now scheduled uh, at a different hospital for a bladder cystostomy, I think that's called, on February 3rd. February 3rd. So uh, God is providing a way and some hope here, and so let's pray uh, that that surgery goes well. Um, they're also praying for some more staff. This ministry has grown uh, to the point where they need more staff, and so that's a real prayer. Um, a a short-term missionary, a long-term missionary from the United States would be wonderful. Um, somebody with a nursing background. <clears throat> we have three or so of those. Uh, anyways, uh, that's a real ministry over there, and we just want to keep praying. And then uh, somebody, again, sent some special money uh, to an organization, and they uh, put on a little beach party, took uh, all the folks to the beach for a year-end uh, celebration. So, praise the Lord for good work and a ministry of compassion. Um, you know, you don't have to go to Africa to get involved in compassionate things. We have needy people right here, don't we, uh, that need our love and care and attention. So... Maybe we could look around and find some areas that we could be involved in. Mm -hmm. Again, let's, uh, let's ask our ushers if they would come, receive our tithes and offerings. And uh, as they do, I'm going to ask John if he would also just remember Wayne and Sue and their ministry, as well as the office. John? Father, I just want to thank you for bringing us all here today. Uh, I want to thank you for sending your son. Uh, I just want to lift up um, Wayne and Sue. Uh, to you, Lord, all our missionaries and all the situations that are going on with them. We just pray for your protection over them and, and um, for the strength and wisdom they need to witness to people and to spread your word, Lord. And just pray that uh, we all give cheerfully today um, and that, uh, that your will be done upon uh, the money we collect. And um, we just want to praise you again for our missionaries, Lord, and uh, just everything that they do, Lord. Uh, just want to lift them up to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
let's, uh, let's arise and sing, all right? Put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. <laughs>
We believe it is a very important issue. It's a scourge, uh, abortion, and uh, some of these issues have been a scourge on our culture, on America, uh, for the last number of years. And uh, so we want to lift up uh, this day as a special day and bring this to our attention. Um, the issue obviously boils down to what's a person's view of the Word of God. And unfortunately, a lot of people have said uh, today, that's a 2,000-year-old book or 3,000-year-old book. It's, it's not relevant anymore. Get rid of it. Uh, it's outdated. It's obsolete. It's a relic of bygone days. Forget it. Well, I don't forget it. Amen. Uh, this is the eternal Word of God. It's the ever-living, abiding Word of God. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest book on earth, unparalleled, it stands. Its Amen. author is God, its truth divine, inspired in every word and line, though written by human hands. Amen. This is the solid rock of truth which all attacks defies. Or every stormy blast of time, it towers with majesty sublime. It lives and never, never dies. Amen. This is the volume of the cross. Its saving truth is sure. Its doctrine pure. Its history true. Its gospel old and ever new. Amen. Shall evermore endure. Amen. I believe that this is God's holy word. Amen. That it is without error. Mm -hmm. It is truth. Jesus himself, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed to the Father, I will. He prayed for us, by the way. I will, Father, that thou sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. It is ever abiding, always abiding truth. It's our more sure word of prophecy. It's more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold. I encourage you to turn to Psalm 119, please. This is the word that is a lamp to our feet, it's a light to our path. Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 118, verse 89. <laughs> Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances. For all are your servants. Catch that first verse. Forever, forever, your word is settled in heaven. This is an eternal word. God's word doesn't change. God, does. it's the same today, yesterday, and forever. It's the unchanging, absolute truth. It's God's word. Look down in verse 152. 119, verse 152. Concerning your testimonies, I have known of all that you have found in them forever. It's unchanging. It is eternally relevant. How about verse 160? The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. God's Word is not obsolete. It's not outdated. Amen. It's as permanently, absolutely good today as it was for the Apostle Paul the day that the Holy Spirit of God caused him to pen those words. That's right. The Word of God endures forever. This is the Word of God, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures that transformed this world by its saving message. It's the book that people are willing to give their lives for, to die for. They live for it, they believe in it, they die for it. No other book is like that. It's the most accurate book in the world. And it's the most accurate book of antiquity. Though it is thousands of years old, it is also supported by thousands of manuscripts and references that go back to confirm its authenticity, its accuracy, and its divine preservation. There's no other book like it. It is a life-changing book. The message of salvation, of freedom from sin. It's a book that was composed by some 40 authors over some 1,600 years in different countries. 
and yet there's not a contradiction in it. It's a book that connects us to the world's, the history's greatest person and greatest event, Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. This is the volume of the cross. There's no other book like it. And based upon the eternally enduring, always relevant, absolute truth of God's holy word, I believe in the sanctity of life. I have a statement I would like to read concerning the sanctity of life. Uh, it is my, my statement, it's uh, similar to one I've read and adopted from other places and con collected and collated different thoughts. But this is what I believe based on the relevancy and the accuracy of God's holy word. That all human life is sacred. From fertilization, conception that is, throughout the human life continuum. I believe that human beings are created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1. God says, let us make man in our image. And he did. And consequently, they are to be honored and protected. Genesis 9, 6. God implemented human government and laws to protect human life because they were created in the image of God. I believe that the weak, the vulnerable, the infirm, the needy, the handicapped, the preborn, the artificially reproduced, the in vitro, the, the genetically enhanced, the chimeras, the pathogenized, the clone, or whatever else becomes human, deserves our respect and our care because it bears the image of God. I oppose any practices, policies, procedures which undermine or deny the God-given right to life of every human being. I reject the notion that there are some lives not worthy of living and embrace the belief that we should graciously receive and protect all human life God gives. I reject the notion that the quality of life is more important than the sacredness of life. It is not. We will respect, honor, protect all human life regardless of their condition, the culture, their circumstances, or contribution to society. We take God's command to love very seriously. That is to love our Christian brethren, to love our neighbors, to love our enemies, which may be the Ninevites or the Romans or the Samaritans or whoever. These may include the homeless and the hooker, the lazy and the immigrant, the unwed, the hypocrite church member, the addict, the mentally or physically disabled, the unattractive, the addict, the disfigured, the preborn infant in the womb, or the elderly, the terminally ill, the artificially reproduced, the genetically altered, the clone, every other condition in which humanness is expressed, expressed from conception to the grave, we love and care for and respect as the image of God. <coughs> Not everybody believes that, though. There is the other side. Who follow, as you see the roots there, the, the, the foundation of this tree, are rooted in humanism. And I'm going to explain that a little more in a little while. But the, the causes... The, the, the humanism is really the cause. The effects of that philosophical system have resulted in the fruits of abortion, euthanasia, and these other things. It, uh, abortion isn't the cause. It is one of the effects of the deeper problem in American culture. This humanistic philosophy of life has a motto, basically says, it's about me. And that's what humanism is. You see the word human there? Man, human, man is at the center of it. Rather than theism where God is center, humanism is where man is at the center. It's all about me, my, mine. It's my life, it's my choice, not God's. It's my decision, it's my body. God doesn't get a say. I'm pro, I'm going to say pro-choice, but it's pro-my choice. 
I can choose to abort. I can choose to live how I want. I can choose whatever sex partner I want. I can choose what gender I want to be. I can choose to die how and when I want to <coughs> die. I can choose to be buried or burned. See, me, my, man is at the center. It's not God. That is the fountain out of which all these other issues come. Those are the effects, those are the symptoms of a deeper problem, and it's called humanism. It's where God has been dethroned. God's word has been uh, thrown off the throne as our authority. No, that's not good. That's old, obsolete. We don't want that anymore. We'll make our own morals, we'll make our own laws. And they enthrone man in its place. Well, if God's not going to make the decision, who does? We do. So humanism is really a false religion, isn't it? It's a dethroning of God. It's, it's the worship of man. It's what it said in Romans chapter 1, uh, where it says that they exchanged the truth for the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. That's idolatry. That's right. And that's what the philosophy of humanism is. And unfortunately, I would suggest to you that that's the foundational philosophy of American culture today. People don't just wake up in the morning and say, well, you know what, I think I'm going to be pro-choice. I think I'm going to believe in uh, euthanasia or abortion or suicide. No. Where did that come from? <coughs> That came from the roots of a philosophy of life and a way of thinking in which God and his word no longer are the authority. And therefore man, me, gets to make up the decision. And it's out of that this comes. American culture has changed. This isn't the America it was 50 or 100 years ago. I know man hasn't changed in its basic sinful philosophy that has pervaded American culture and has grown. Actually, it started way back in the 1700s, but it's becoming uh, very prevalent today. And these are four philosophies of life. Really, humanism is the more broad one. These others are part of that, really. Uh, and I just want to explain a little bit, because this really, these, these philosophies have what dethroned the authority of God's Word. And, and, and I know we're not going to be in here studying the script, the, the very verses themselves today, but I hope you understand what I, what I understand, that, that, you, that the thinking of Americans today, for the most part, is unbiblical. They've cast aside the Word of God and in preference put themselves on the throne. Humanism, and by the way, that bottom picture there, uh, good without God is... Um, that's the motto of the American Humanist Association. Um, good without God. They don't believe in God. Don't, it's all right. All we have is each other. <laughs> it's a very ungodly, atheistic way of living. Um, and I took this right off their website. Humanism rejects religion. <coughs> it attributes nothing to the so-called supernatural. In this... This one author says, in this there is an awakened liberty that releases us from the shackles and servitude mentality of old superstition that so, we, so that we may realize our full potential. That, well, one of the consequences of humanism taking over is that it, is, it has in fact released people from these old superstitions. Yeah, well, that's what we call the Bible, God's holy commands, what is good for his people. You know? We've been released from that, they say, and so we can let everything out of the closet. And what it has done is unlocked and unleashed all the pent-up sinful habits of mankind. And, and now we're making it legal. <laughs> and we're paying for it with our tax dollars. And That's humanism. Man is in charge. Rationalism means that everything is is judged. Our ethics are determined by what we think. Reason is the primary and most superior source of knowledge about reality. Reason. <coughs> we don't need God. We don't need His Word. We can think this through on our own. Reminds me of uh, one of my little grandkids. I'm not going to mention either who it was, but the other day I was trying to help him do something. 
Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> now you're going to figure it out. <laughs> I can do it myself. <clears throat> Isn't that just like a, an ignorant child? This is the right way. We know as a parent, this, that, that block isn't going to go in there that way. You have to turn it. To get it. I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. And God says, this is the way you do it. And man says, I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. I can figure it out. I don't need you, God. Mm -hmm. And so our beliefs, everything is based on what we reason ourselves. Relativism, that is that everything's relative. It's truth. Is relative. In other words, there's no such thing as absolute truth. We used to believe, and our culture even did, originally believed in transcendental truth, higher law, that there are some inalienable rights. Among these were the right to life, that they were endowed to us by our Creator. But that's absolute truth. Those are absolutes that people in our culture don't believe anymore. Everything is relative. Knowledge, truth, morality exists in relation to culture, society, or historical context are not absolute. Truth has to change. It has to morph, adapt according to circumstances, times, and places. So it's right, it's wrong. Well, it depends. Maybe now it's okay. It's okay to lie if it helps you out of a bad situation. It's okay to lie if it makes your wife feel better. No. Lying is sin. Lying is wrong. God's truth hasn't changed. <clears throat> Pluralism. Actually, this illustration in the bottom right there, the 2 plus 2 equals 4 and the 2 plus 2 equals 5, that's probably a better illustration of pluralism. That's a system of ethics in which two or more principles or sources of authority that coexist. That is, they're equally true. God is obviously not the sole authority anymore. Contradictory views of truth are all considered equally valid and true. Whatever you believe is true, that's true. Even though it may be totally contrary to what he believes is true, or what God's word says is true, it doesn't matter. It's true, it's true for you. And we have to not only tolerate that, we have to accept that it's equally true. And so that two sources of authority can be totally wrong and totally opposite, yet they're, yet they're both true. I know it. Doesn't sound rational to you and I, but but that's a philosophy that's prevalent today, and and that's one of the symbols that's pretty common on bumper stickers. That's a uh, really a, a great illustration of the pluralistic thinking. They're all true. <coughs> so you have these two diametrically opposed views, really. Theism, God centered. It's the Judeo-Christian ethic that exalts the Word of God. And when you ask somebody there, in, uh, what do you base the life decisions on? What is it that when it comes to right and wrong, yes and no, life or death, abortion or not, what do you base the decision on? Someone from the Judeo-Christian ethic would uphold the Word of God and say, God's Word. Amen. This is the truth. Right. Uh, the Old Testament law, the New Testament scriptures, the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments, whatever. They go back to the scriptures and say, thus saith the Lord, that's the truth, that's what I'm going to do. That doesn't happen too much anymore. And then you've got humanism on the other side. Everything is relative. <laughs> What's true for one, true for another, doesn't matter. Man makes up his own morals and rules as he goes along. You ever play a game with somebody who does that? <laughs> it's my game, I'll make up the rules as we go along. Deb and I do that pretty good. <laughs> because I'm the head of the home, I get to make up the rules as I go along. And I am almost always the champion, the grand champion, because I make up the rules. But you know what, when it comes to God and life, He's the only one that gets to set down the rules. Man doesn't get to make up the rules as he goes along. <laughs> Under Judeo-Christian ethics, there's, world, there's laws, there's morals, there's ethics, there's right and wrong that never change because God's word never changes. 
They're absolute. They're transcendent. They're higher law. They're inalienable. They're unchangeable. You don't mess with them. They're sacrosanct. In other words, you don't trespass on these. You don't question these. You don't change these. You don't mess with these. These are God's laws. And you can't improve on them. All his judgments, remember, are forever. Amen. His word is forever settled. Amen. His truth doesn't change. <laughs> they're, not, uh, they're not open to public opinion. They're not negotiable. They're not up for personal choice. They're never up for debate. They're not on the table for political consideration. It's not what the Congress or Senate decides is right or wrong. It's not even what the Supreme Court decides is right or wrong. <coughs> what God says is right or wrong, and that's where it ends. Amen. That's theism. That's the foundation of my life. And I hope yours as a Christian. But the other side, humanism. Where did that start? Well, that goes way back. Actually, we can go back to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. God created man and put him in the garden and he said, Thou shalt not eat of this tree. That's the first thing that Satan said. Hath God said? Hath God said? No, you make up your own rules. You do what you want to do. Won't this make you happier? Satan appealed to Adam and Eve with that same thing. Don't listen to God. Do what makes you happy. Really, the roots of humanism right there. But as a as a organized philosophy, it took Satan many years to mastermind <coughs> this. And the uh, uh, but it can go back to the Renaissance in Italy, the Enlightenment in France. Ultimately, it came to the United States back in the 1700s by people that we revere, people like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin brought with them <coughs> Enlightenment thinking. A, they lived in a culture of theism where the culture for the most part believed that there was higher law, God's law, inalienable rights. They spoke of the Creator and uh, the, the Almighty God. But at the same time, while they lived in that culture and spoke of the Creator and God, they also brought in a rationalism. They brought in a, 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 the seeds of humanism. And they were casting doubt upon the Word of God and saying, no, you should have more faith. You should really trust in the scientific method more than in God's Word. There's a better way to do things. Reason. Reason. Let's reason this out. I know that takes precedent over the Word of God. Now, and, and so there was the seeds planted way back then of this philosophy. And it, it grew. And now they're only absolute under humanism. Their only absolute they believe in is that there are absolutely no absolutes. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't make any sense. It's the same philosophy, though, that Margaret Sanger in the 20s and 30s when she sought to sterilize black men, <coughs> women as quote-unquote weeds of an inferior race. It was the philosophy that prevailed in Nazi Germany and led to the extermination of six million Jews and, and blacks and gypsies through their <coughs> ethnic cleansing, their racial cleansing. It was the philosophy of Dr. Jack Kevorkian. By the way, I used to have some free gift certificates for, uh, well, for a visit from Jack Kevorkian, but they're only good for one visit. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they're no good anymore, they've expired. But whether or not the issue is gay rights or abortion or euthanasia or transgender or gender identity or physician-assisted suicide, they're all interchangeable pieces in the same puzzle and they all spring from the same foundation philosophy that is humanism. Mm -hmm. That we get to make up our own decision in our own mind and, and determine what's right and wrong, not God. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so you have the two. Creation. Why do we believe that? God said so. On the other side, you've got evolution. You've got pro-life. You've got abortion. You've got elderly compassion and care. 
On the other side, you've got euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide. You've got traditional family values under theism, with pornography, sexual perversions, divorce, homosexuality, transgender, all those issues that they don't only want you to tolerate, they want you to accept as equally valid and true and support them in it. Theism protects human life because God says it is made in the image of God. The other wants to protect wildlife and falsely call for humane treatment. Well, we should treat them kindly, animals, but we don't treat them humanely, okay? We don't treat them as a human because they're not. There's a difference between when God created all the animals and then he created man in his image. Man is not just an animal. He is a sacred being with an immortal soul. <coughs> animals don't have that. I don't care how nice Fido is. He doesn't have an immortal soul. We believe in the sanctity of human life, and we don't equate animal life with human life. Human life. We believe in absolute transcendent values founded upon the Word of God. Humanism believes in utilitarian, pragmatic, pluralistic, relativistic, greed, whatever, to substantiate their decisions. And by the way, before I even get to these divine truths, it's difficult to carry on a debate with people sometimes today. And the reason that is, is because we want to reason from a theistic standpoint. We want to sit down and from our mindset, we have absolutes and there's such a thing as absolute truth, transcendent, transcendent laws that are inalienable. But many people who've been raised in a humanistic, pluralistic, relativistic culture, they don't, they don't rationalize or think the same way we think. And so it's very difficult to even carry on a conversation sometimes, a rational conversation. And then you have people who we cross the two. And that's what we find a lot of right now, too. It's a blend of people who've been raised in a culture in the last 40 or 50 years in America where from the time that they were in kindergarten in the educational system or watching TV or movies or uh, advertisements have been ingrained in a false philosophy of thinking and now they're saved and they're trying to inculcate the Word of God as their authority but, but there's some real contradictions in their lives because of that. Still all about me being happy. <laughs> so humanism is. In fact, let me just quote uh, again from, from the humanist website. It says, they trust in the scientific method when it comes to understanding how the universe works and we reject the idea of the supernatural. <coughs> we make our ethical decisions based on reason, empathy, and a concern for human happiness and other self-conscious and feeling animals. And we believe that in the absence of an afterlife and any discernible purpose to the universe, human beings can act to give their own lives meaning by seeking happiness in this life and helping others do the same. <laughs> it's about personal happiness. And, and so you know what? We're getting, we're getting churches filled up now with Christians who come out of a culture being ingrained in in, in this humanism that has really personal happiness as its ultimate objective. So we have Christians that are <coughs> one foot on both sides of the grave. One side of the grave. One foot in the grave, one, side, one foot in the world, and one foot in the church. It affects churches. Now we have churches that are, they purport a theism God, His Word, is an authority, and yet the goal of the church is to make the people happy. You see, you got the two trying to come together. And their worship experience is not whole life commitment, surrender to God. Worship then becomes a one hour exciting experience. Drama, lighting, entertainment, 
which is the paradigm of the world. It, it's, it's difficult um, to carry on a conversation because the foundation is different. The philosophical basis of reasoning and thinking is different. Yeah. It used to be when we used to witness to somebody that at least we were on the same philosophical <laughs> foundation. We were, we were all from the theistic foundation. So that the person I was witnessing to, even though they didn't believe in Christ or believe in God, at least they disbelieved the same God that I believed. Do you understand that? At least they understood that they were rejecting God's word and God and they weren't going to follow him. Today, that's, that's out of the realm. They just don't even believe that either God exists or that he has any authority. And, and so we, we reason on two different things. On two different foundations. Well, we come back and I have to hurry through this. Uh, but these are just some of the divine truths that have to do with this matter of sanctity of life. We're created in the image of God. It's clear. Yeah. Human government was established to protect God's image. That is the foundational reason government was started, you know, that God implemented government in, in Genesis chapter 9. Because of his image is sacred. And man is to be protected. And life is to be protected. God's law details the sacredness of life. And I could have put 50 scriptures up there concerning God's laws in the Old Testament and how important it was to protect and promote life because it's sacred in the eyes of God. Psalm 139 details for us how God is involved in the formation of the child in the womb. That, that there in the secret parts of the womb, God is at work knitting us together and making us the individual, the unique person that we are. That's in the womb, the pre-born. He's been working for nine months now in Amber's belly, creating another grandchild for me, and her time is almost up. <laughs> so we'll pray for her in the next day or two. We may have a new grandson. A daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and in James, you're not even supposed to curse another human being. He said, James says, out of the same mouth proceed both cursings and blessings. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Because we are made in the image of God. Don't gossip. This is not even just against another Christian. Don't talk that way, bad mouth, slander any person. They are the image of God. That's right. Mind your tongue. <coughs> God is the sovereign giver of life, the disposer of life. Our times are in His hand. The time of our life, the time of our death. That's God's business. And there is a divine purpose to all of life. You say, well, the quality of my life is going downhill. Mine is. And by the way, let's be praying for Jeff. Wagner, they took him to the, 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 the emergency room just a little while ago because of some heart thumping. But uh, all of us, as we get older, we start having more aches and pains and great limitations and a lot of problems. And we say, oh, our quality of life is, is going downhill. And, and, and then all of a sudden we're handicapped and, and disabled and then we're in bed and now we're affirmed and, and, and it's getting worse. And at what point do we say that the quality of my life is not worth living? Never. Quality of life never is more important than the sacredness of life. God has given life. And we protect and promote that, and there's a purpose to every portion of life. Our manifestation of the truth, our mission work, our challenge as Christians in this society, Paul says it's by manifestation of the truth. We proclaim the truth, teach the truth. But you know what? That's hard. This mission map up there and is a picture there reminds us of our going into different cultures, different languages, different uh, climates, uh, different people groups. But you know what? Here in America, the Christian who stands on a foundation of theism has got to somehow take the absolute truths of this and manifest it, proclaim it, explain it to those who are of a different philosophical foundation. And that is oftentimes harder than going into a foreign country. But that's our mission. And it requires 
dependence upon the Holy Spirit to bring insight and illumination of the absolute truth of God's Word. We can't do it ourselves. Teach and preach the truth and let the Spirit of God do His work. Well, we want to be a blessing. We want to be a blessing to all people. Let's let our light shine. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would use us to love people, to care for people who are created in your image. And Father, uh, help us to understand how other people in this world think and really how Satan's blinded their minds. How it says in Romans that they, wanting to become wise, professing to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They began to worship and serve the creature, mankind himself, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Father, we love you. We bless your holy name. We lift up your sacred word as the authority of our lives. And we ask that as we take it to this culture, as we try to manifest it to the unsaved people in this world, Lord, that your spirit would go before and open eyes and open minds and bring understanding and bring salvation to these people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to stand and join with me as we sing, Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing.